You ever notice how the media loves to paint certain people as villains? Especially if they challenge the status quo, speak truth to power, you know, make the people in charge a little uncomfortable. They throw out labels, cherry pick quotes, take things out of context, and boom, instant public enemy number one. Today we're diving into one of those figures, a man who's been demonized, vilified, and misrepresented for decades, Louis Farrakhan. We're going to peel back the layers of propaganda and see if the man matches the myth they've created. Are you ready for this? Let's address the elephant in the room, Farrakhan's rhetoric. Yeah, he's made statements that are inflammatory, even offensive to some. No doubt about that. But are we judging him fairly? Are we really listening to what he's saying? Or are we just reacting to the carefully curated sound bites the media feeds us? Are we taking those statements out of context, ignoring the nuances, the complexities of his message? See, I think it's easy to get caught up in the outrage to focus on the most shocking sound bites without really understanding the context. Farrakhan's rhetoric isn't coming from a vacuum. It's a product of his experiences, his upbringing, the historical context he emerged from. Remember, this is a man who came up in the 60s and 70s, a time of intense racial tension and struggle in America, a time when the civil rights movement was facing fierce resistance, when black people were being brutalized, murdered, denied basic human rights. His words are a reflection of that reality, a reflection of the anger, the frustration, the pain felt by so many in the black community. And even today, when we talk about his controversial statements, how often are we actually hearing his words in their entirety versus someone else's interpretation? Are we reading his books, listening to his speeches, engaging with his full body of work, or are we just consuming the carefully edited clips designed to elicit a specific reaction? We need to ask ourselves, are we truly engaging with Farrakhan's message, or are we just consuming the caricature they've created? Because if we're not careful, we end up judging a shadow, not a man. Imagine growing up in a world where your people are treated as second-class citizens, where you see injustice and inequality every single day. Imagine the anger, the frustration, the sense of powerlessness that would build up inside you. That's the world Farrakhan came from. He witnessed firsthand the brutality of segregation, the systemic racism that permeated every aspect of American society. He saw the dreams of his people deferred, denied, crushed under the weight of oppression. And he wasn't alone. Millions of black people felt that same anger, that same frustration, that same desperate yearning for change. His rhetoric, however inflammatory it may seem to us now, was a reflection of that collective pain, a voice for those who felt voiceless. So when we judge his words, we need to remember the context. We need to understand the historical backdrop, the lived experiences that shaped his worldview. We need to ask ourselves, would our own words be any different if we had walked in his shoes? If we had witnessed the same injustices, felt the same pain? Let's be real, the media loves a good villain. They need someone to demonize, someone to point the finger at, someone to blame for the problems in society. And Farrakhan, with his powerful rhetoric, his uncompromising stance, his willingness to challenge the status quo, makes for a perfect target. They cherry-pick his most inflammatory statements, play them on repeat, and present them without context, without nuance, without any attempt to understand the deeper meaning behind his words. They paint a picture of a dangerous extremist, a hate monger, a threat to the very fabric of society. But how often do we stop and ask ourselves, who benefits from this narrative? Who benefits from silencing a powerful black voice that challenges the system, that exposes the hypocrisy of those in power? Who benefits from keeping us divided, afraid, and suspicious of those who dare to speak truth to power? We need to be critical consumers of information. We need to question the narratives we're being fed, to dig deeper, to seek out alternative perspectives. We need to be willing to listen to Farrakhan's own words, not just the distorted versions presented by those who seek to demonize him. Let's talk about the Million Man March. Love him or hate him, you can't deny the impact of that event. In 1995, Farrakhan called for black men to come together in Washington, D.C. for a day of atonement, reconciliation, and responsibility. And they came. 
They came from all over the country, from all walks of life. Hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million, black men standing shoulder to shoulder, united in a powerful display of solidarity and purpose. Think about the message of that march, a call for black men to take responsibility for their families, their communities, their own destinies, a call for atonement for past mistakes, for reconciliation with each other and with themselves, a call for black men to step up and become the leaders, the protectors, the role models their communities needed. The media, of course, focused on the controversy, on Farrakhan's perceived extremism, on the potential for violence. But they missed the bigger picture. They missed the power of that moment, the unity, the hope, the sense of collective purpose that resonated throughout the black community. They missed the fact that Farrakhan had tapped into something deep, something primal, something that transcended the fear and division they tried so hard to sow. It's easy to focus on the negative, to get caught up in the controversies, to dismiss Farrakhan as a radical, a hate monger, a dangerous demagogue. But what about the other side of the coin? What about the positive impact he's had on countless lives? Farrakhan has been a tireless advocate for black empowerment, for self-sufficiency, for community development. He's spoken out against the forces that have ravaged black communities, drugs, violence, crime, poverty, and he's challenged black people to take control of their own destinies. He's built schools, created economic opportunities, and provided a platform for black voices to be heard. He's inspired generations of black people to embrace their heritage, their culture, their own sense of power and agency. So why don't we hear more about this side of Farrakhan? Why is the media so quick to dismiss his positive contributions, to focus solely on the controversial aspects of his message? Could it be that a message of black empowerment, of self-reliance, of challenging the status quo, is simply too threatening for those who benefit from the existing power structure? For decades, Farrakhan has been urging black people to clean up their communities, to reject the destructive forces that hold them back, to embrace education, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance. He's spoken out against gang violence, drug abuse, and the breakdown of the family. He's called for black men to be responsible fathers, for black women to reclaim their dignity and self-respect, for black communities to come together and build a better future. This isn't just empty rhetoric. He's backed up his words with action through the Nation of Islam's various community outreach programs, economic initiatives, and social services. He's put his money where his mouth is, investing in black businesses, supporting black schools, and providing resources to those in need. So why isn't this part of the narrative? Why is the media so fixated on the controversial while ignoring the constructive? Could it be that they're more interested in perpetuating stereotypes, in reinforcing the image of black people as helpless victims, than in showcasing the efforts of those working to uplift their communities from within? Maybe it's time we start paying attention to the full picture, to acknowledge the positive impact Farrakhan has had alongside the controversies that grab the headlines. Now let me be clear. I'm not saying Farrakhan is perfect. He's a complex figure, a product of his time, and his views can be challenging, even jarring, to modern sensibilities. He's made statements that are offensive, that many would consider hateful. I'm not here to defend those statements or to downplay the hurt they've caused. But I am saying that we need to look beyond the simplistic villain narrative that's been constructed around him. We need to engage with him critically, to understand the context of his words, to grapple with the complexities of his message. We can't just dismiss him as a hate monger and call it a day. We need to ask ourselves, why is he so demonized? What purpose does it serve to paint him as a dangerous extremist? What are we afraid of? Because if we're truly honest with ourselves, we might find that the answer is more unsettling than we'd like to admit. Maybe we're afraid of the truths he speaks, the systems he challenges, the power he represents. Maybe we're afraid of a black man who refuses to play by the rules, who speaks his mind, who demands justice and equality on his own terms. Think about it. Why is Farrakhan so threatening to the powers that be? Why is he constantly labeled a dangerous extremist, while others who espouse similar views often escape such scrutiny? 
Could it be that his message of black empowerment, of self-reliance, of challenging the status quo strikes a nerve? Could it be that his critiques of systemic racism, of economic inequality, of the military-industrial complex hit a little too close to home for those who benefit from the existing power structure? After all, a black man who encourages his people to take control of their own destinies, to build their own institutions, to challenge the systems that have kept them marginalized for centuries, is a force to be reckoned with. And that force, that potential for disruption, is what makes those in power nervous. They need us to believe that Farrakhan is a villain, that his message is dangerous, that we should be afraid of him. Because if we start listening, if we start thinking for ourselves, if we start to see the world through his eyes, we might just realize that the real threat isn't Farrakhan, it's the systems of oppression that he's been calling out for decades. You see, silencing a voice like Farrakhan's allows those in power to maintain the illusion of control. It allows them to perpetuate the narrative that everything is fine, that progress is being made, that we're all on the same team. But if we look at the issues Farrakhan has been raising for decades, issues like racial inequality, police brutality, economic disparity, the school-to-prison pipeline, we see a different picture. We see a system that's rigged against certain groups, a system that perpetuates poverty, violence, and despair in marginalized communities. And that's what makes Farrakhan so dangerous to the establishment. He doesn't play the game. He doesn't sugarcoat the truth. He doesn't shy away from pointing out the hypocrisy, the corruption, the systemic failures that keep so many people trapped in a cycle of poverty and oppression. By labeling him a dangerous extremist, they hope to discredit his message, to make us afraid to listen, to prevent us from confronting the uncomfortable realities he exposes. But what if, just what if, his so-called extremism is simply a reflection of the actual extremism of the systems he's challenging? What if his anger is justified? What if his frustration is a natural response to the ongoing injustices that plague our society? It's easy to dismiss Farrakhan as a relic of the past, a voice from a bygone era of racial strife. But if we look at the issues he's been raising for decades, we see a startling continuity, a thread that runs from the civil rights era to the present day. We still have racial inequality in America, in every facet of society, from education to health care, from housing to employment, Black people continue to face systemic barriers, implicit biases, and outright discrimination. Police brutality is still a reality, with black men and women disproportionately targeted, harassed, and even killed by law enforcement. Mass incarceration continues to devastate black communities, tearing apart families and perpetuating a cycle of poverty and despair. And the economic disparities? They're as stark as ever. The wealth gap between black and white Americans is vast and growing, a testament to the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, and ongoing economic discrimination. These aren't just abstract problems, folks. These are lived realities for millions of people in this country. And they're the very issues that Farrakhan has been speaking out against for decades, the issues that have earned him the label of extremist and hate monger. So while we may not agree with everything Farrakhan says, while we may find some of his rhetoric distasteful or even offensive, maybe there's something to be learned from his persistence, from his unwavering focus on the issues that continue to plague black America. Maybe we should be asking ourselves why his message resonates with so many, even after decades of being demonized and marginalized by the mainstream media. Could it be that he's tapping into a deep well of frustration a sense of anger and betrayal that stems from the unfulfilled promises of equality and justice? Could it be that his words give voice to the pain, the anger, the fear that many feel but are afraid to express? Maybe, just maybe, his so-called extremism is simply a reflection of the extremism of the injustices he's confronting. Maybe his anger is a righteous anger, a necessary response to the ongoing oppression that continues to define the lives of so many. Let's talk about power for a minute. Who gets to define what's extreme? Who gets to decide which voices are acceptable, which perspectives are worthy of consideration? When a powerful black man like Farrakhan speaks out against injustice, challenges the system, 
and calls for his people to rise up, it's seen as a threat. It's labeled as radical, dangerous, even subversive. But when someone from the dominant group, someone white, someone wealthy, someone with access to the halls of power, says similar things, they're often hailed as heroes, as visionaries, as bold leaders who are speaking truth to power. Think about it. How many white politicians, academics, or media personalities have made statements that could be considered inflammatory, even hateful, without facing the same level of scrutiny and condemnation as Farrakhan? The double standard is clear. When a black man challenges the status quo, he's a threat. When a white man does the same, he's a hero. And that double standard is part of the system of power that Farrakhan has been challenging for decades. It's a system that seeks to silence dissenting voices, especially those from marginalized communities, and to maintain the illusion of control. We see this double standard play out time and time again. A black activist who calls for economic justice is labeled a socialist, a communist, a threat to the American way of life. A white politician who advocates for similar policies is hailed as a progressive, a champion of the working class, a bold visionary. A black leader who criticizes U.S. foreign policy is branded an anti-American radical, a traitor to his country. A white intellectual who raises similar concerns is lauded as a courageous dissident, a champion of peace, a voice of reason in a world gone mad. The examples are endless, and they point to a fundamental truth about power. It's not just about who controls the resources, it's about who controls the narrative. It's about who gets to define what's acceptable, what's normal, what's considered extreme. And as long as we continue to allow the dominant group to control the narrative, to define the terms of the debate, we'll never truly be free. We'll always be playing by their rules, dancing to their tune, and accepting their version of reality. The media loves to portray Farrakhan as a divisive figure. They say he sows discord, that he preaches hatred, that he sets black people against white people, but what if he's actually doing the opposite? What if he's simply exposing the divisions that already exist? What if he's holding up a mirror to society and reflecting back the ugliness, the inequality, the deep-seated resentment that we've been trying to ignore for so long? He's not creating the divide. He's revealing it. He's giving voice to the pain, the anger, the frustration that many feel but are afraid to express. He's forcing us to confront the uncomfortable truth that we're not all on the same team, that the game is rigged, and that some of us are starting with a significant disadvantage. His rhetoric, however inflammatory it may seem, is a symptom of a deeper sickness, a reflection of the broken promises, the unfulfilled dreams, the ongoing injustices that continue to plague our society. It's a scream of anguish, a cry for justice, a desperate plea for recognition and respect. And instead of dismissing him as a dangerous demagogue, maybe we should be asking ourselves, what is he trying to tell us? What truths are we afraid to confront? What are we so desperate to silence? It's easy to write off Farrakhan as a radical, a fringe figure, a voice from the margins of society. But what if his so-called extremism is simply a reflection of the extremity of the injustices he's railing against? What if his anger, his frustration, his uncompromising stance is a natural response to a world that continues to deny basic human dignity to so many? What if he's not the problem, but a symptom of the problem? What if he's a canary in the coal mine warning us of the toxic fumes that are poisoning our collective soul? Maybe, just maybe, we should be listening to what he's trying to tell us. Maybe we should be paying attention to the issues he's raising, the truths he's exposing, the systems he's challenging. Instead of dismissing him as a villain, we should be asking ourselves, what is he seeing that we're missing? What truths are we afraid to confront? What are we so desperate to silence that we're willing to demonize a man who, for all his flaws, has dedicated his life to fighting for the upliftment of his people? We live in a world that loves to simplify, to categorize, to put people and ideas into neat little boxes. Good or bad, right or wrong, hero or villain, it makes things easier to process, easier to digest, easier to dismiss. But the truth is, the world is far more complex than that. Human beings are complex, ideas are complex, and the issues we face as a society are complex. 
If we're serious about creating a more just and equitable world, if we're serious about addressing the root causes of inequality and oppression, we need to be willing to embrace complexity. We need to be willing to listen to all voices, even the ones that make us uncomfortable, even the ones that challenge our preconceived notions, even the ones that we disagree with. Because it's in those uncomfortable spaces, in those challenging conversations, in those encounters with perspectives that differ from our own, that we have the opportunity to grow, to learn, and to expand our understanding of the world. It's in those moments that we can break free from the simplistic narratives that keep us divided and start to build bridges of understanding, empathy, and compassion. It's easy to surround ourselves with people who think like us, who share our views, who reinforce our existing beliefs. It's comfortable, it's reassuring, it makes us feel like we're part of a tribe, a community of like-minded individuals. But it also creates an echo chamber, a bubble where our own ideas are amplified and reinforced, while opposing views are silenced and dismissed. We become more entrenched in our own beliefs, more resistant to new information, more suspicious of those who dare to challenge our worldview. If we truly want to create a more just and equitable world, we need to be willing to step outside of our echo chambers. We need to be willing to engage in dialogue with those who hold different perspectives, to listen with an open mind, and to challenge our own biases. We need to recognize that even those we disagree with, even those we find offensive or even hateful, may have something valuable to teach us. They may help us to see the world from a different angle, to understand the complexities of issues that we thought were simple, to confront the, the blind spots in our own thinking. So the next time you hear Farrakhan's name, don't just accept the label they've slapped on him. Don't just swallow the sound bites, the cherry-picked quotes, the carefully constructed narrative designed to make you fear him, hate him, dismiss him. Dig deeper. Listen to his words for yourself. Understand the context, read his books, watch his speeches, engage with his ideas, and then, then decide what you think. Don't let the media tell you who to fear, who to hate, who to dismiss. Don't let them spoon-feed you their version of reality. Think for yourself. Challenge the narratives. Be willing to see the world from multiple perspectives, even if those perspectives make you uncomfortable. Because the truth, as always, is far more complex, far more nuanced, far more interesting than the simplistic stories we're often told. We live in a world of information overload. We're bombarded with news, opinions, and narratives from every direction. It's easy to get swept up in the current, to passively consume whatever's being fed to us, to let others do our thinking for us. But that's a dangerous path. It leads to a world where we're easily manipulated, where we react instead of reflect, where we accept the pronouncements of authority figures without question. It's time to reclaim our own minds, to become critical thinkers, to question everything we're told, to seek out alternative perspectives, and to form our own conclusions. Don't let the media tell you who to fear, who to hate, who to love, who to trust. Think for yourself, challenge the narratives, be willing to see the world through multiple lenses, even if those lenses make you uncomfortable. Because the truth is rarely black and white. It's usually found in the shades of gray, in the nuances, in the complexities that we often try to ignore. So let's talk about Louis Farrakhan. Is he a villain, a prophet, a revolutionary, a demagogue? Or is he something more complex, something that defies easy categorization? something that forces us to confront our own biases and assumptions. I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm here to challenge you to think, to think critically, to think deeply, to think for yourself. Engage with his message, explore his ideas, challenge your own preconceptions, and then come to your own conclusions. Hit me in the comments. Let's have a real conversation about this complex and controversial figure. Let's unpack the myths, dissect the narratives, and explore the uncomfortable truths that Farrakhan's legacy forces us to confront. Because if we're not willing to have these difficult conversations, if we're not willing to challenge our own beliefs and biases, then we're not really serious about creating a more just and equitable world.